Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today we're going to talk about people, we're going to talk about profit, we're going to talk about how those two come together as you are looking to build your business, expand your company. Our guest here today is Jeffrey Chant. This is his expertise. He works with companies on how to connect their purpose and their people and their profit together to really create extraordinary results. And so I'm really excited to have him here. Welcome Leaders of Transformation. Yeah, thank you. Glad to, uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And a shout out to Jocelyn Duffy for the introduction. Jocelyn has been amazing. She was on our show a while back. And if, for those of you that haven't heard that episode, it was one of my all-time favorites. So uh, you can check that out. Jocelyn, J-O-S-C-E-L-Y-N right? So there's an extra little letter in there. But anyway, you can find that on leadersoftransformation.com. But today, uh, we're going to talk with Jeffrey. And uh, Jeffrey is a thoughtful, engaging presenter and compassionate coach who closes the gap between seemingly separate worlds. So he's drawing on his experience in pastoral psychology, education, uh, and education combined with his years as an international corporate executive and consultant. Um, and, you know, he encourages us to accept the fact that we prosper when we are both people and profit focused. Um, he has a unique way where he works with the organizations to connect that, uh, connect them to their people, to their purpose, as well as to their bottom line. Uh, what's interesting is some of you may uh, be familiar with the Arbinger Institute. Uh, I read one of their books, The Art of Self-Deception, many years ago. Excellent, excellent book. Well, Jeffrey actually started Arbinger Canada and Bermuda at what point in time and, and worked with uh, the Institute to expand their reach there. And, uh, and he's actually worked with a number of organizations and companies ranging professional services, oil and gas, insurance, finance, IT, government, healthcare, and the nonprofit sector. So he's coming with a wide range of experience. And uh, so we're really excited to have him here. We're also excited to have you here as the listener and the viewer, if you're watching uh, online. And uh, we're really excited to have you here because you know what, you're the reason why we do this podcast. It's to inspire you to be the difference maker, to go out into your communities, your corner of the world and make an impact or maybe even make a global impact. That's why we're here to do this. And we hope that our guests here that we have on this show will help you to do that. We'd love to hear your story, so find us on social media, Leaders of Transformation. We're all over social media. Of course, you can also go to the leadersoftransformation.com and connect with us there, but we want to hear your stories and what you're doing to make an impact because I do believe that there's so many people who are doing amazing things in the world, mm -hmm. and if we can connect those difference makers and world changers, we can have a greater impact together. We can really, truly change the conversation. So speaking of conversation, uh, Jeffrey, let's, uh, let's dive into it with you. I mean, I kind of gave them a broad sketch as to your background uh, and your experience in, in the corporate world and so forth. How did you actually, and you were a pastor initially, like how does a pastor get into the business world? Yeah, well, I think you did a great job explaining it, so thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep this, this brief, but, uh, you know, really, I'd say, you know, kind of growing up, especially through my teenage years, um, I, was, I was always uh, conscientious in the sense that I felt, you know, we're called to do something. And, uh, and so spent a lot of time discerning what that was, much more than just what's a good career, what pays well, what should I take in university. And I uh, was always active in uh, the United Church of Canada. I wasn't one of these kids that sort of strayed away for five or six years, right? Um, that being said, I was also very entrepreneurial and very focused on business. And that's, that's really what I thought I was going to uh, do for a career. So, um, so very early on, I, I really felt, look, that uh, I had to make a choice between the two. Uh, either I go into business or I go into uh, ministry, uh, nonprofit work. And that's what I felt led to do. And, and look, at that time in my life, I really thought it was a split. It was an either or. And I think it had to be seen that way for me. Um, and, and what I've learned sort of over the years is, that of course, it isn't, right? That these two facets of myself, um, you know, needed to be integrated. So uh, when I got into ministry, working in the church, obviously, you're, you're working with people and uh, in some pretty uh, dire circumstances, you know, uh, I worked in a chaplaincy residency in a children's hospital, you know, with, with children dying and uh, a forensic unit in a prison and, and then in pastoral care work where, where, as you know, you're working with people in, in the worst moments of their lives as well as the best, right? 
And uh, it became very apparent that there's great people with great passion, great purpose. And this isn't only in the church. Um, this was also in the not-for-profits I was working with. And, and they've got great stuff. They're, they got great purpose, but, but really weren't bringing a lot of business acumen to what they were doing. And in fact, in some not-for-profits, it's almost seen as a taboo to, to talk about money. Uh, there, you know, I've met executive directors, I've met clergy as well, who actually pride themselves um, on not being involved with the money side of their organizations. And you know, if you want a sustainable, purpose-driven organization, you've got to look at the revenue side of it. And, Absolutely. Uh, right? And you have to pay attention to it. And because you're doing that, that doesn't lessen your purpose. Uh, but, but at times, there can almost be um, a self-righteous attitude about it that, well, we're about higher things. And that's great, but if you know if we run out of go out of business because of, we're not paying attention, that's a problem. So I started to bring a lot of business, I think, uh, best practices to the organization. Looked at looked at ways around sustainable revenue, and, and one of the things that I noticed is um, a resistance to it at times, and also a real split um, that we shouldn't be about that or. Uh, we, you shouldn't worry about that sort of as the lead person. And, and, and so it was almost like part of me was, was being denied in a sense. Um, and I stayed in ministry for uh, professional ministry, I guess, for 10 years. And, uh, and then I you know, went through that point uh, where uh, I had now completed some uh, business education at Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. And, and at Harvard, I did some executive education. Uh, I have a uh, edu master's of education and counseling psychology. So I was sort of blending those things. And that's when I first came across the Arbinger Institute, leadership and self-deception, et cetera. And, and it's that same old story where, you know, do you want to be 75 looking back, wish you hadn't tried some. So uh, at that point I was ministering in Bermuda. Uh, I left Bermuda, um, went to, a, you know, moved back to Canada, went to Ikea, set up a home office and said, let's, let's see what we can do. And uh, that's when I grew the uh, Arbinger Institute in Canada and um, started to work inside organizations and businesses um, around the other side, right, which is uh, results, accountability, and profitability. Um, and, of course, what I realized there is um, <clears throat> the corporate world isn't perfect, and, and often they lose sight of people. Um, as much as organizations will say people are our greatest assets and I only hire the best and people smarter and brighter than me and all, all of that, and I think some people maybe do, um, there's a hierarchy that it exists in our industry, in our work industry, that, you know, I think metrics, profit, and productivity are seen as, as, as more important and higher than, than people, purpose, and culture. And, and it's not an either or, it's an and. And so that's why I talk about the and organization. And that journey within organizations has been the same journey for me, right? Um, working in, in not-for-profit and church for 10 years and then growing my own business, you know, sort of that entrepreneurial setting. And then my first corporate job was as an executive vice president of an international oil company. Um, and so I've stepped in all those worlds. And I know for a lot of people, they see them as very separate. I mean, you sort of indicate that in the question, right? How do you go from this to this? And I really see that they're all integrated. Um, yeah. They're all integrated, right? Yeah, it's it's funny because um, uh, I have this saying that I say to clients sometimes because, you know, I work with purpose-driven entrepreneurs that are like, money's not important. And I said, well, you know, actually, I, I appreciate that your purpose is actually really, really important. I've always been mission-driven, mm -hmm. never even thought of business that wasn't like that. Uh, that's how I grew up. My parents were that way, no matter what they were doing. It was always a mission out front. And the business was the vehicle to fulfill that mission. But in order to do that, it needed to be profitable. And, uh, and so it's funny. It's like, well, you know what? At the grocery store, they don't take good intentions. They take cash. That's right. Right? Like, you know, it's, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm just such a good person and I'm helping people. And they're like, okay, that's, that's awesome. How, the bill is, <laughs> right? like, you know, this has to be paid. And in the nonprofit sector, sure, you can get donations and so forth. But either way, that's a money conversation, whether you're generating it through sales or whether you're getting it through donations, mm -hmm. uh, tithing, offerings, whatever you want. There's, there is the money conversation yeah. that because that 
that fuels everything. And what you said on the other side is the companies that are um, saying, yeah, we're, we're all about our people. And yet when you look at the reality of it, if they have to push come to shove, if they've got to pick one, they're going right. to pick profit over people almost all the time. Most right. organizations, or they'll, they'll support their people. And this is my experience too. It's like in working with companies, it's like, you know, they'll, they'll work with their, they're, they're happy to support their people as long as the profit's there. If profit's not there, then, you know, and so the fact that you're bringing these th two things together is really important. And I know there's a lot of uh, leadership consultants nowadays that are going into companies and talking about the uh, importance of the, how these things come together. And yet at the same time, even though there's a lot of people talking about it, it's still not, it's still not where it needs to, to be from that. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and so let me say a couple of things. One is I would say, if you're a purpose-driven organization, whether you're not-for-profit or you're a for-profit trying to save the world with, with some great product, it's in some sense, in my view, irresponsible um, to not shore up the financial and the profitability, you know, profitability side of the business. Because if you don't do that, then your great purpose and your great mission is going gonna, is gonna to go away. So yeah, um, the, you got to go get a job like somewhere yeah, else. <laughs> to, they they, they go hand in hand. It doesn't and work. So, that's, that's right. And, and lots of people talk about it. Lots of people have talked about it for a long time. And I'll just, you know, may, maybe others have said this, but, you know, one of the first questions I'll ask in a boardroom, which normally has values around, is I always ask, because I, I, my background or part of what I was doing in, in the corporate world was around performance management, is what are the consequences if somebody violates one of these in the organization? Respect, teamwork. Great question. And, and the question is almost always nothing. And, and then I'll say, okay, so, so let's, let's look at your performance management. Let's look at how you bonus people. Let's how, look at what conversations you're having. How do you reward people? And, and generally, people are being incentivized to perform on the productivity, profitability side of the business, not on the other side of the business. And, and I just say, look, those things need to be equal. Like people respond to what, to what they're incentivized to do. So. Yeah. To have a culture like that, you really have to dig in. Uh, the the other piece is, um, and this this will take us down a whole other path, I suppose. But I really believe that the the challenge in in the in, in industry or in business is that we think that the solution uh, to culture initiatives and value initiatives and that is behavioral training, and so all we have to do is get training, right? Or we have to learn to talk differently to people. And, and, and the, the challenge with that is that's not where our influence is. So, so we've been led to believe in a very metrics competent based world that our influence with other people is around my competence. When the reality is people don't respond to competence, they respond to care. So, so I, I would sort of, you know, put out there that, look, if, if you're my employee, right, and I have to have a difficult conversation with you, um, and so I learn all the perfect skills of how to have difficult conversations with Nicole who's messing up and I'm going to sit her down and I'm going to reflect back and, and make sure she's in a safe, quiet space and all of that, that's all good. But if I don't care about you, if I really just generally don't care about your success, you know it. And, and so in one sense, you know, I'm polished, um, but there's something not right. And you, you can tell, and I'd almost say the inverse, I could actually be fumble through that. Okay. Like maybe I'm not perfectly skilled at those conversations, but do care about you and you'll forgive all of my, you know, blunders, right? Because you know that I have your success and your interests at heart. Um, for me, I just go back to teachers, right? There's teachers that, you know, when they corrected me, I thought, what a jerk, right? Like, yeah. I did not want to, you know, do my best for that teacher. Other teachers would say the same thing to me and I would feel ashamed, right? I'd, I'd work harder and want to do better. Um, so the irony is that um, we try to demonstrate competence um, and our influence with people is, is at a level of care and compassion. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because uh, I actually have a, I have a mentor of mine. I oftentimes refer to what things I learned from my mentor and um, different mentors I've had over the years. And one of them, he said, you can say pretty much anything to someone if they know you care about them. Yeah. 
and and that's the key in what you said there about measuring based on and you know looking at behavioral changes that need to be made. I was actually just last night reviewing a um, uh, what do you call it an intake application for a major yeah. corporation, and what they like their their assessment that they do. Uh, for people that are applying for jobs. And it was so interesting because one of the questions that kind of was repeated in several different ways uh, was, you know, that decision making and problem solving is all based on facts. Uh. Do you highly agree, you know, sort of agree, not agree, whatever. And I was thinking about that. I'm like, that's an interesting question. Because on the surface, you can say, well, absolutely, you got to deal with the facts. But if you don't deal with the other side of it, right, mm -hmm. uh, it's the facts, but it's people. There's both sides of things. It's not just a hard, fast answer and saying, well, these are the facts, too bad, right? We're going to do this. That's, uh, that's not going to get you uh, ultimately the results. I mean, are you looking for, to have people who strictly are just facts-based and, you know, and then there was another question talking about where do personal feelings come in and do they come in at all? And, and I found it was so interesting because when you think about it, you, you can't ignore the personal feelings. There's bringing drama in and there's bringing your up and down moods into your day to day. Uh, but then if you actually think that you can ignore all of that in your, with your, you know, that's, that you can ag not yeah. acknowledge that that's what's going on for people, that there are even anxiety, uncertainty nowadays, which is at the all time high. If yeah. you don't deal with that, uh, then you're missing a huge piece of this. And I think this is what you're in part, what you're talking about. It is. I, I think that we've, yeah, absolutely. I think we've kind of, uh, what's the word we we've made our businesses very clinical and, um, you know, facts are actually kind of easy. You know, I tell managers all the time, if it was only about enforcing policy or going to facts, we don't need you, right? We can now write algorithms to do that. Yeah, business um, is easy if there weren't any people involved. I mean, exactly. We say it all the time. So, so yeah. everyone kind of knows that. We kind of chuckle about it. And then, then my question is, then why aren't we putting the time and energy and resources into developing our character, developing our culture, developing our own self-awareness, our own ability to demonstrate compassion? Um, we're really good at the the um, the business science, I call it side, right? Um, we can eke out another half percent of productivity, and 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 look, any senior leader I've talked to uh, in in a coaching context never says, you know, Jeff, I'm just up all night trying to get my spreadsheet to work. You know, that's not what haunts them. Um, it's that we've now created. We have workplaces, and we call it being professional, and we have great business speak and. And, you know, even the focus on metrics historically is, is a small blip, right? Um, but we go to that like it is, it is the rule, right? It is the rule of law. And, and profit's important. I say it all the time, right? Profit fuels our business, but people drive it. And it's pretty short-sighted, really, as leaders to lose sight of that. And I think you'll see, we see, when we look at the greatest leaders and organizations, they are people that will talk very positively about of the care of people and culture. Yeah. Um, and so we just have to sort of relax. I say, you know, bring our humanity to work, right? Um, we are people and we have emotions and, uh, and we do care about each other or can care about each other. So, so one of the questions is then why don't we, right? Yeah. Um, why don't we? And, you know, Arbinger, uh, when I was working with them, they have their own sort of philosophical way they talk about it. I actually think, um, you know, there, there's something else going on and it's biological, right? You, you mentioned it earlier. People are under a lot of pressure, deadlines and stress. And we know this sort of from basic neurology that when we're under, under stress, uh, we go into survival mode, right? And so it's, it's a primitive part of our brain. Uh, the amygdala kicks in and we go into survival mode, right? And I just, I was just picture, you know, the uh, national geographic shows, and the lizard sticks his head out and he's kind of looking around and he pops his head back in. And, and that's kind of how what happens at work, right? We're walking around and we're going, um, are they going to eat me, right? Are they out to get me? Uh, or are they my enemy, right? I got to get them. Or they just don't matter. And so great, now we- Great we, visual on that. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Poking well, out of every office. Oh. We, we think about, look, you go to, a, we, we'll talk about colleagues that way, right? She attacked me. 
right? Or we all know you go into a meeting, you're feeling great, you go in and you look around and you go, oh no, you know, so-and-so's here. The energy completely shifts. And so now we turn people into something less than the fullness of their humanity, which is they're either for me, against me, or don't matter to me, right? And yeah, people know that. True. And now, now we either have the feeling about they're manipulating me, using me, or out to get me or whatever. And now there's a whole other game happening. And, uh, and we can learn to overcome that. There's an indicator that I use in my business um, that measures our biological response to pressure. It's quick, it's easy, it was developed in business. It's an awesome tool uh, called Market Force. And, uh, and I use that because we can learn to understand how, what our survival strategy is and then how to overcome it. Uh, and inversely, try to try not apply pressure to others, right? Yeah, because I was just thinking, because as, as this is happening to us, at the same time, mm -hmm. this is also people going, how do I manipulate? How do I maneuver myself in the best possible light? Uh, where am I? I? I notice that a lot sometimes people, when they'll get into rooms, they'll um, kind of determine where their position is, right? Like their right. level of influence, right? Am I... Do I, can I have influence over the people in this room or am I going to be the one who's inf influenced or manipulated depending right. on the way that you're, I mean, if you're looking at it from survival, it's not necessarily influence. It's more about the uh, ego and the, and the manipulation, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah it's so, so it goes both ways in that. It does. And so what, if, if I don't understand how this functions, I, I inadvertently apply pressure to others and then I put them in that place and now they're not in a place of prosperity. They're not in a place of their best. They're not in a place of, you know, um, we, you know, employees, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I was at uh, working with a client not too long ago and uh, uh, in between our sessions, I'm in, in the men's room and there's a, a kind of a junior employee in there and I just said, hello. I said, Hey, how's your day? He said only four and a half more hours and I'm out of here. Right. And so, his mindset is wow. I have to survive this place, right? And so yeah. the question is, if, if I'm in that mode, do you think he's given his best? Is he giving anything extra? Does he, is he gonna go that extra step at all? No, he's just doing what he has to do so he can get out of there at, at 4.30 and do whatever he has to do. And so we, we talk about in, in organizations, we chalk it up to office politics, we'll talk about personality difference or, or even by industry, right? That's just an IT kind of guy or whatever. And it's all smoke and mirrors, right? Because if we generally care about people, all that goes away. And I don't, I don't now condemn you for being different than I am or for functioning different than I am. I learn how to work with you in a way that helps you and helps me. And that's what care is. That's what compassion is, right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, it, it's amazing what happens when when we start to care for people. And, and this isn't any new insight. We do it in our personal lives all the time. And then we walk into an office building and suddenly we check our humanity at the door uh, because we're scared, right? We, yeah. We're scared to get close. We're scared to get hurt. And so, you know, one of the questions, just, just thinking out loud when you're talking about this intake form, you know, often we'll see questions about uh, what was the time when you didn't have a solution or you came up with a solution in a difficult situation. Uh, you know, maybe a question to consider is when is the time you saw a colleague struggling and you demonstrated compassion? Yeah, uh, absolutely. That, that, none of that, none of that was on this intake right. at all. When you say right. that, like nothing about how you actually, it was all about what happens, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And, but not how do you, how do you, how can you be there for other people? Very interesting, very interesting mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Right. So magnanimous. Mm -hmm. That's a big word it is. for a company name. That's I love awesome. it. Um, Why did you call it that? Do you know, I, I don't know if you had this experience, but it's a word that's stuck in my head for a long time and I always said, you know, that's what I'll call my company. I have friends in the branding it, uh, world, and maybe some are listening, who, who think it's, it's a difficult name. Uh, it's hard to spell. People can't say it. Um, but magnanimous literally means, and you'll see different definitions, but <laughs> the Latin of it, magna means great or big. You think a magnum of wine or something, right? And animus, you know, has sort of different um, definitions depending on tradition, but it really means mind and soul or mind and spirit. And so it means a great mind and spirit. And so I, I talk about organizations needing to have great capacity. So, you know, or great competence, but great capacity as a business. Yeah, we got to look at that and great care. 
And when you put the two of those together, then you have a magnanimous organization or like as a leader, a magnanimous leader, right? Um, like it. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's where it comes from. I mean, if we think of, if we think of the best uh, people in our life, you know, people that we just think of as great people, and I'll do this exercise with people, is just jot down the characteristics and attributes of someone that you just consider a great human being. Normally, the, the list includes things on the competence or capacity side. You know, their results, they were driven. Um, they were focused. They were clear. Um, they got results, right? That's there. And so is they care. They coach me. They spend time with me. They were compassionate. They apologize. And, you know, uh, you put those two together and it's, it's an amazing experience. And, you know, most of us have probably had managers or bosses that we've seen both of those sides. Um, yeah. And likewise, look, I'm really clear too. You can be the greatest guy in the world, but if you're not delivering results and focused on the, res the results and, and holding people accountable, you're just a nice guy. And I don't, I don't want you in my organization either. That doesn't tend to be our problem though. Um, yeah. Our problem tends to be rewarding the, uh, just the sort of the skill behavioral and metric side. So you work with companies. So I, um, there's so much that we could talk about here um, in terms of awareness, in terms of application. Uh, for our listeners out there yeah. that lead organizations and or are within organizations mm -hmm. that are looking to become, maybe there's middle managers or even entrepreneurs people that ha are managing themselves and creating judgments about themselves yeah. and their own performance uh, and building a team around them. What would you recommend in terms of first steps uh, that they can take? And, uh, and then I know that you, you know, you also have a website and you've got information where people can get, take things further from there. For, so for first steps, first steps for them to sort of, consider what we're talking about yeah to start to incorporate this i mean it's great to conceptually mm. talk about this yeah but now how do we put this into practice yeah. well let me let me yeah let me just throw some things out, out there um we're we're really good um in our lives of walking around and measuring how other people are impacting us and and if we're if i'm doing that other people are probably doing the same thing so i like to just invert that right i call it the uh, for fun, the I am, right? The inverted accountability metrics, which is to basically say, what's it like to work with me? Especially when I'm under pressure, right? What's it like for my secretary when she can't get time with me and I'm holding her up for making decisions she needs to make? What's it like for my team when as a leader, um, I'm not really listening, I'm only coming up with the answers, right? What's it like for me, um, uh, or what's it like for them, sorry, to work with me. And, and, and look, if I ask 100 managers what type of manager they're at, they are, they'll all tell me, look, I'm fair, uh, I have an open door policy, uh, I care about the company, right? A, a leader never says to me, you know what, I'm fair with some people and other people I'm a little harder on, right? Or my door is oh closed gosh. for some and open for others. And so it's that self-awareness piece. And so I say, look, what if we had a video camera, right? in your office, what, you know, recording your day with your people, what would we see? And usually we have a disconnect between the biography or the story we tell ourselves and, and reality, right? And so I need to go explore that video a little bit and, uh, and say, you know, what am I noticing? Um, the other tip I would say is that, that- That's actually before you go to the next tip, yeah. that's, that's a really important piece because self-awareness is a topic that is coming up more and more often. Like you said, most of us know the impact that other people have on us, but we don't look at the impact that we have on others. I, uh, being a business coach, I, I have a business assessment and I've gone in and I remember using initially, I was using a tool uh, that somebody else had created and said, oh, we've got this awesome business assessment. And it was so funny because I was looking at it and going, uh, okay, so you, uh, you want me to ask the leader how good they are at leading others. What do they say? I'm amazing. Yeah. Of course, I'm a fantastic leader. Yeah. Now, if I go ask the people in the organization, uh, now I get the whole picture and the reality mm -hmm. of what their impact is. And that's what you're talking about here. So step one is start looking at that. Ask, you, you asked some great questions there. Um, this would be a great additional resource is a series of questions for people that they can um, 
that they can ask themselves because like we don't know what we don't know. And oftentimes, you know, the quality of our answers is based on the quality of our questions. So if we ask ourselves better questions, it hooks the mind and starts to create it, you know, rather than how am I as a leader? Pretty good. You know, but like now when you're asking some of these specific questions, then you get a different, you get a different answer and high qual higher quality answers. So that's number one. And then yeah. start looking and, and, and then maybe even asking your other leaders within your organization to do the same thing. And you can then debrief some of that information. So I just wanted to unpack that as a. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I think there's a caution. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of 360s and, and because yeah. Yeah. there's a whole, a whole game that can be happening. But if, it's, if I'm asking somebody that I trust, right, a colleague that I, I trust and they're going to give me honest feedback, that's good. But, but I would much rather a leader get the insight themselves, right? I was referring, sorry, I was referring to the leaders all doing it for yep. themselves. That, that's Not right. Not so and, much and, the 360 and asking somebody else who's, who's afraid to tell you the truth. Okay, good. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, that's real responsibility in leadership is, and, and, you know, the first response sometimes leaders will give is, well, how do I know? I don't know, right? But there's a lot we know because we're human beings and we know what it must be like for others. It's that's a bit of an excuse, yeah. Right? It's empathy. And so I think there's two things that business leaders, you know, really need to develop. Uh, one, so, so I'll take the first one. The first is curiosity. If I can develop a mindset of curiosity, it will suspend judgment and blame. So I'm in a meeting and, you know, somebody says something that I just think is a wacko idea or, or a crazy statement. Instead of blaming them and going into, well, that's a dumb idea. You know, curiosity would say, oh, I wonder where that came from. I wonder, you know, if there's any truth to it. I wonder if there's something I'm missing. Right. Um, if there's an openness to curiosity, um, it's much more exploratory. Uh, and the other is compassion. And, and I talk about compassion as being empathy in action. So empathy, you know, um, uh, I think it's Bob Chapman uh, talks about getting inside the heart of another is, is empathy, which I think is really a, a, a beautiful image. Um, so empathy is being able to sort of, you know, we don't know everything, but what ask what would their world must be like? What do we know about their work? What do we know about um, being in that type of position, whatever their role is? There's things that we do know. Um, but compassion is now what I do out of a, com a compulsion of feeling empathy, right? I take some action. Oh, she's swamped with her work. I can empathize with that. Compassion would say, I'm going to go help her, right? Um, but the second is this. We, we don't often as managers make a, a clear intention or declaration about the type of manager we want to be. So we look around and we see good managers and what, but we're busy, right? And three months turn into a year, turn into six years. And I try to encourage sort of in my magnanimous sort of management program is that people really declare the type of leader or manager they want to be, which would in involve both of those things we talked about earlier, capacity and care. And then you go and you work at it like you would anything else. And, and you become curious about that and you build, build that into your identity. And just like culture gets formed, regard, whether we manage it or not, so does our identity. And, and often our identity, unfortunately, gets formed of how we behave and react when we're under pressure. Um, people get reputations as, you know, um, being hotheads or you can't talk to them about certain issues or avoid them on Wednesdays because that's, you know, whatever day. And, and they develop this identity that they're not even aware is happening. And it all comes from this sort of uh, biological response. So we need to take some ownership of that and we can manage that, right? I just declare the type of manager you want to be, declare the type of spouse you want to be, the type of father or mother, whatever it is. Um, we can we can make a, a clear declaration about that, and that's intention. I love that. It's actually um, you mentioned the word responsibility, mm -hmm. and I think it is uh, taking the responsibility for how you want to show up and declaring it. Like you said, I I think that uh, there's a lot of emphasis now on what coaches can do for us. And we're, I've had actually people say to me, I want to hire you. I, I need somebody to kick me, kick my butt. Mm -hmm. That is not my job mm -hmm. ultimately as a coach. If I have to kick your butt all the time, like that's, 
there's something else going on here. And right. as if we're talking about leaders and people that want to make an impact and have a purpose and a mission they want to fulfill, then it's also our responsibility to not rely on somebody else from the external. Let's hire a consultant, although those are all great and we can hire you and others to come in and work with our teams and with us, but to take the responsibility to say, this is actually my life and this is my company or this is my job, my career and my reputation. Mm -hmm. And so it's also my responsibility to create that the way that I, that I want it to. And I, and I think that's a, uh, that's a really, we can skim over it, but it's a really, really important piece is people actually taking the ownership and saying, yeah, who do I want to be? What kind of manager you know, you can say, well, nobody's taught me. Okay, well, so fair enough. Yeah. The, but, the one that I'll comment on here too are the is, one, yeah. is that, you know, there's a lot that gets kind of blamed or put on the company. Yeah. Um, and while I don't see leadership doing that, I don't see other people doing it. And I always say, well, who told you you couldn't do it? Yes. Right? Um, that permission. They, You're waiting right? for permission. Did anyone say you yeah. can't sort of be more caring and compassionate? Did anyone say you can't spend more time with your, like, no one, no. Well, okay. So now it's just an excuse for why you're not doing it. So there's a lot we can control within our, our sphere as well, even in difficult. Look, I'm, there's difficult people and there's difficult organizations and cultures for sure. Um, but there is more that we can control within our group than I think sometimes we think, right? And I've certainly seen yeah. that change happen in, in leaders. I talked to one yesterday who you know, I'll tell you three years ago, and this is the other thing, this is not a, you know, a quick cure always either. Uh, three years ago, he was very much despised by his coworkers. Um, and he's now uh, a national director of an organization and probably one of the most beloved colleagues in, in his organization and he gets results, right? And, I, and you know, talking to him yesterday, he said, so what's the biggest learning you've had over the last three years? He says that I can get results and care about people. Um, and, you know, and so his retention's gone up, his, his loyalty on his team is fierce, um, and, and he's with his people, right? But they're delivering, right? It's not just a good, good time kumbaya club, right? Yeah. Like, they're, they're effective, and that's why they're effective. Yeah. Well, and that's your legacy. That's what you're building. Talk about purpose and yeah. living on mission. Um, that's the legacy that you get to uh, leave and that you get to be proud of that you're actually helping people in this. And as simple as it sounds, it is super, super profound uh, mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So where do people go? They go to your website, magnanimous.ca. And for those of you that don't know how to spell magnanimous, that's yeah. okay. We've got it at leaders of transformation.com. You yeah. just type in Jeffrey um, and or Jeff and his uh, episode, this particular episode show notes will come up. And you can uh, click on the link there. It'll all be available as well as some of his social media handles. Um, Jeff, what are they going to find when they go to magnanimous.ca? I do love yeah, that. So, it's a great, such a great word even saying yeah. it. Like so there, there's a few things. One is, uh, first, there's a quick video on there on what I call the four Ps, right? Purpose, uh, people, productivity, and profit. I um, encourage you to watch that. But I do have a download there, a free download of if people want it and how to become a more compassionate colleague or caring colleague. Uh, in yes. fact, it, it's probably tell it how to get others to care uh, the same as you do. Uh, but of course we all know that the irony in that is others care when you do, right? So uh, the real work to get others to care is for you to start to care. And uh, that invites that in them. And uh, so I've got five sort of quick personal pivots that, uh, that people can do and to think about. Uh, just some of those things that we've talked about today, you know, what are some of the things that I do know about the challenges and, and what, what their work life is like? How have I added to that? Like, how have I actually made some of those things worse? And, uh, you know, and what am I compelled to do when I, you know, when I really see this as, uh, see the other as, as somebody that is, is maybe different than me, has different responsibilities, but they're a human being, right? And we forget that, you know what? I show up to work and I'm frustrated some days. Guess what? It's probably fair that other people are too. And I worry about my kids. Guess what? Other people probably worry about their kids too. And, uh, you know, we, we are on this, you know, this human journey. You know, the writer, Jean Vanier, who started the Larsh community, right? He has a book. Uh, it's got the best title ever. It's called Becoming Human. 
and you know sort of implies that we're, we have to kind of become human and some of us we have to learn or learn again to uh, care to love others to uh, to love ourselves and embrace um, sort of who we are and what we have to offer and to not compare that to others that just to acknowledge that others have that as well others have great days and good days and bad days others are worried about their careers others are under deadlines like I am and uh, I have a choice to either make that better for them or to make it worse and uh, we all know how that goes so yeah uh, I'm encouraging that we we think about that and, and really that we move to to what I call prosperity right and Organizational prosperity uh, for me is really a, a financially flourishing organization, right? But an organization that has a great culture of care and capacity that's built to, to support, you know, happy, thriving, engaged people. And uh, it's not a conversation about choosing one over the other. It's about, it's a conversation that we need all of it. It's sort of like that, you know, the, the splits that we want to make. And uh, that was certainly my own journey. And, and so we have to start to integrate these things, right? Yeah. Um, and, and each of us do it in our own way, right? You can't emulate, you, you know, I say integrate, don't emulate. You, you have your own way of doing that and, um, and be, you know, sort of gentle with yourself as well um, because it is a process. But when we declare it and we're intentional about it, we do start to see results and sometimes immediately. Um, I, I just got to tell you really quickly, um, I was at a Christmas, got invited to the Christmas party of one of my uh, corporate clients. And uh, I was there and um, a woman comes up to me and she says, you're Jeff, right? I said, yeah. And, and she's the magnanimous guy, right? And I said, yeah. she says, can I give you a hug? And she mm-hmm. says, I said, sure. She says, ever since my husband went to your workshop, he's been different. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to thank you. And, um, you know, and that's not me, it's the information and, and the process that shared and him doing the work and realizing, you know, uh, how he's been sort of seeing his life partner, right? And, um, and, and he realized it and changed, right? So it's a really cool story because for me, because we look just for the work stories and they're not all disconnected, right? So he's better at work and he's better at home. Um, in fact, I think in some ways, because we spend so much time at home in this sometimes overly clinical, professional, business speak world focused on metrics and objectives, that we can carry that into our home life, right? Yes. And now that's how we parent. Um, and that's how we partner in relationship. Yeah. And, and we, we, we lose the soul of it. We lose the, the magic, the love, the wonder, and the humanity of it all. And, oh, it's uh, correlated for sure. It's correlated for, for sure, sure, right? So Well, and what yeah. you talked about prosperity, um, you know, prosperity is more than money. Uh, there's a book yeah. out there, you know, uh, that most people are familiar with, Think and Grow Rich. Right. Think and Grow Rich is more than being rich monetarily, mm-hmm. you know, and, and books that talk about, uh, you know, wealth and wealth is much more uh, than than just making money, and that's what you're talking about here. And like you said, it's it correlates. You know, you spend all this time at work, and how you are, how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you're going to be that way, and you're developing habits that many hours a day, right? It's it goes to you know obviously follows that you're going to be applying those in other areas. You're not going to be a different person, uh, you know, when you all of a sudden when you come home. So. Um, now, this has been really, really great, Jeff. So for our listeners out there, I encourage you to go to magnanimous.ca. We'll make sure the link is on, as I said, Leaders of Transformation. We'll also make sure that the link to that uh, free gift from Jeff is there as well, so you can access that. And uh, I always encourage uh, our listeners and our viewers to take action on something. So maybe today for you, maybe it's just stopping and asking yourself some quality questions about how uh, are others impacted by me rather than always asking the other way around. Ask, you know, how, how are others impacted by me? How am I perceived? What, is, what am I known for? Mm-hmm. What am right. I known for? Maybe going and reviewing the questions that Jeff has asked. He asked some really great questions earlier in the uh, conversation here. You know, so start asking yourself some quality questions and start looking at how people and purpose and profit and productivity, how this all ties together. It's not an either or conversation. It's an and create an and organization for yourself, whether that is you and you alone 
you know, be, be compassionate with yourself, be empathetic with yourself and make sure that you get results. And whether, or if you have a large organization, the same applies and it starts with us. So I encourage you to do that again, Jeff, thank you for being here. And uh, yeah. we look forward to seeing you all on the next episode of leaders of transformation real soon.